<laughs> Descending a long incline in this tunnel, we traversed a drift or so, and then went down a deep shaft from whence we proceeded into the fifth gallery of the Eau Faire. <clears throat> from a side drift, we crawled through a small hole and got into the midst of the earthquake again. Earth and broken timbers mingled together without regard to grace or symmetry. A large portion of the second, third, and fourth galleries had caved in and gone to destruction. The two latter at seven o'clock on the previous evening. At the turntable near the northern extremity of the fifth gallery, two big piles of rubbish had forced their way th through from the fifth gallery. And from the looks of the timbers, more was about to come. These beams are solid. 18 inches square. First, a great beam is laid on the floor, then upright ones, five feet high, stand on it, supporting another horizontal beam, and so on, square above square, like the framework of a window. The superincumbent weight was sufficient to mash the ends of those great upright beams fairly into the solid wood of the horizontal ones, three inches, compressing and bending the upright beam till it curved like a bow. Before the Spanish caved in, some of their 12-inch horizontal timbers were compressed in this way until they were only five inches thick. Imagine the power it must take to squeeze a solid log together in that way. Here also was a range of timbers for a distance of 20 feet, tilted six inches out of the perpendicular by the weight resting upon them from the caved galleries above. You could hear things cracking and giving way, and it was not pleasant to know that the world overhead was slowly and silently sinking down upon you. The men down in the mine do not mind it, however. <sighs> Returning along the fifth gallery, we struck the safe part of the Eau Faire incline and went down it to the sixth, but we found ten inches of water there and had to come back. In repairing the damage done to the incline, the pump had to be stopped for two hours, and in the meantime, the water gained about a foot. However, the pump was at work again, and the flood water was decreasing. We climbed up to the fifth gallery again and sought a deep shaft, whereby we might descend to another part of the sixth out of reach of the water, but suffered disappointment as the men had gone to dinner, and there was no one to man the windlass. So having seen the earthquake, we climbed out at the Union incline and tunnel and adjourned, all dripping with candle grease and perspiration, to lunch at the Eau Fair office. During the great flush year of 1863, Nevada claims to have produced $25 million in bullion, almost, if not quite, a round million to each thousand inhabitants which is very well considering that, one, that she was without agriculture and manufacturers. Silver mining was her sole productive industry. Since the above was in type, I learned from the, an official source that the above figure is too high and that the yield for 1863 did not exceed $20 million. However, the day for large figures is approaching. The Sutro Tunnel is to plow through the Comstock load from end to end at a depth of 2,000 feet, and then mining will be easy and comparatively inexpensive. And the momentous matters of drainage and hoisting and hauling of ore will cease to be burdensome. This vast work will absorb many years and millions of dollars in its, in, in its completion, but it will early yield money for that desirable epoch will begin as soon as it strikes the first end of the vein. The tunnel will be some eight miles long and will develop astonishing riches. Cars will carry the ore through the tunnel and dump it in the mills, and thus do away with the present costly system of double handling and transportation by mule teams. The water from the tunnel will furnish the motive power for the mills. Mr. Sutro, the originator of this prodigious enterprise, is one of the few men in the world who is gifted with the pluck and perseverance necessary to follow up and hound such an undertaking to its completion. He has converted several obstinate congresses to a deserved friendliness towards his important work, and has gone up and down and to and fro in Europe until he has enlisted a great moneyed interest in it there.
Chapter 53 Jim Blaine and his grandfather's ram Filkin's mistake Old Miss Wagner and her glass eye Jacob's the coffin dealer Waiting for a customer His bargain with old Robbins Robbins sues for damage and conflict and collects a new use for missionaries the effect his uncle Lem and the use Providence made of him sad fate of Wheeler devotion of his wife a model monument what about the ram every now and then in these days the boys used to tell me I ought to get one Jim Blaine to tell me the stirring story of his grandfather's old ram but they always added that I must not mention the matter unless Jim was drunk at the time just comfortably and sociably drunk they kept this up until my curiosity was on the rack to hear the story I got to hunting Blaine but it was of no use the boys always found fault with his condition he was often moderately but never satisfactorily drunk I never watched a man's condition with such absorbing interest such anxious solicitude I never so pined to see a man uncompromisingly drunk before at last one evening I hurried to his cabin for I learned that this time his situation was such that even the most fastidious could find no fault with it he was tranquilly serenely symmetrically drunk not a hiccup to mar his voice not a cloud upon his brain thick enough to obscure his memory as I entered he was sitting upon an empty powder keg with a clay pipe in one hand and the other raised to command silence his face was round red and very serious his throat was bare and his hair tumbled in general appearance and costume he was a stalwart miner of the period on the pine table stood a candle and its dim light revealed the boys sitting here and there on bunks candle boxes powder kegs etc they said Shh, don't speak he's going to commence the story of the old ram I found a seat at once and Blaine said I don't reckon them times will ever come again there never was a more bullier old ram than what he was grandfather fetched him from Illinois got him got him of a man by the name of Yates Bill Yates maybe you might have heard of him his father was a deacon Baptist and he was a rustler too a man had to get up rather early to get the start of old thankful Yates it was him that put the greens up to ginning teams with my grandfather when he moved west Seth Green was probably the pick of the flock he married a Wilkerson Sarah Wilkerson good creature she was one of the likeliest heifers that was ever raised in old Stoddard everybody said that knowed her she could have to borrow a flower as easy as I can flirt a flapjack and spin don't mention it independence hump when Sile Hawkins came a browsing around her she let him know that for all his tin he couldn't trot and harness alongside of her you see Sile Hawkins was no, it weren't Sile Hawkins after all. It was a galoot by the name of Filkins. I disremember his first name, but he was a stump. Come in prayer meeting drunk one night, hooraying for Nixon because he thought it was a primary. The old Deacon Ferguson up and scooted him through the window and he lit on old Miss Jefferson's head. Poor old Philly. She was a good soul, had a glass eye and used to lend it to old Miss Wagner that hadn't any to receive com company in it weren't big enough and when miss wagner weren't noticing it would get twisted around in the socket and look up maybe or out to one side and every which way while the other one was looking as straight ahead as a spyglass grown people didn't mind it but it most always made the children cry it was so sort of scary she tried packing it in raw cotton but it wouldn't work somehow the cotton would get loose and stick out and looked so kind of awful that the children couldn't stand it no way she was always dropping it out and turning up her old dead light on the company empty and making them 
uncomfortable because she never could tell when it hopped up being blind on that side, you see. So somebody would have to hunch her and say, your game eye is fetched loose, Miss Wagner, dear. And then all of them would have to sit and wait till she jammed it in again, wrong side before as a general thing. And green as a bird's egg, being a bashful creature, an easy sort sought back before company. But being wrong side before weren't much difference any anyway because her own eye was sky blue and the glass one was yaller on the front side. So whichever way she turned it, it didn't match no how. Old Miss Wagner was considerable on the borough, she was. When she was a quilting or Dorcas city at her house, she generally borrowed Miss Higgins' wooden leg to stump around on. It was considerably shorter than her other pin, but much she minded that. She said she couldn't abide crutches when she had company because they were so slow. And when she had company and things had to be done, she wanted to get up and hump herself. She was as bald as a jug, and so she used to borrow Miss Jacobs's, Jacobs's wig. Miss Jacobs was the coffin peddler's wife, a ratty old buzzard he was that used to go roosting around where people was sick, waiting for him. And there that old rip would sit all day in the shade of a coffin that he judged would fit the candidate. And if it was a slow customer and kind of uncertain, he'd fetch his rations and a blanket along and sleep in the coffin nights. He was anchored out that way in frosty weather for about three weeks once before old Robin's place, waiting for him. And after that, for as much as two years, Jacobs was not on speaking terms with the old man on account of his disappointing him. He got one of his feet froze and lost money, too, because old Robbins took a favorable turn and got well. The next time Robbins got sick, Jacobs tried to make up with him and varnished up the same old coffin and fetched it along. But old Robbins was too many for him. He had him in and appeared to be powerful weak. He bought the coffin for $10, and Jacobs was to pay it back, and 25 more besides if Robbins didn't like the coffin after he'd tried it. And then Robbins died, and at the funeral he burst it off the lid and riz up in his shroud and told the parson to let up on the performances because he could not stand such a coffin as that. You see, he had been in a trance once before when he was young, and he took the chances on another, calculating that if he made the trip, it was money in, it, in his pocket, and if he missed fire, he couldn't lose a cent. And by George, he sued Jacobs for the rhino and got judgment. And he set up the coffin in his back parlor and said he lowered to take his time now. He allowed to take his time now. It was always an aggravation to Jacobs the way that miserable old thing acted. He moved back to Indiana pretty soon, went to Wellsville. Wellsville was the place the Hagedorns was from. Mighty fine family. Old Maryland stock. Old Squire Hagedorn could carry around more mixed liquor than cuss better than most any man I ever see. 